Welcome to Conversations in Color, a weekly series committed to open, honest conversation and exploring hard questions regarding race and racism in Western Wisconsin and beyond. Here is your host, Ed Hudgens. Well, hello there and welcome to Conversations in Color. Uh, this is a weekly show where we focus on race and racial issues, racism, anything that has to do with racial justice. Um, my name is Ed Hudgens. I'm so happy you're joining us. I work with Converge Radio uh, here in Eau Claire in Western Wisconsin. And um, I'm in Converge is one of the sponsors or the host, or, or I should say sponsors, one of the people who makes organizations that makes this thing possible. Uh, also, Uniting Bridges and the Pablo Center help present this show as well. Wow. I'm grateful for that. Um, before we get into talking about our subject matter tonight, talking about the Confederate flag, and I put that in quotation marks because we'll unpack that a little bit, a little bit later. I um, want to talk about the, the three kind of pillars or main tenets of how we have conversations together. Uh, first of all, we focus on, we, 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 one of our pillars is humility. And what I mean by that specifically is we, we come into these conversations knowing that we as human beings are frail and limited, and none of us has a full grasp on, well, pretty much anything. And if we're honest, we don't even know ourselves all that well sometimes. So uh, humility is a key piece of the, uh, of the equation here. Another one is honesty. We don't want to be afraid to ask. We're not going to be afraid to ask hard questions and to lean in on hard stuff and to just be honest about what we see and what we hear. And then lastly, but certainly not leastly, is humanity. And what we mean by that is that we're going to value the the uh, we're going to honor the dignity and value in each human being. Nobody on this show is going to be devalued or degraded. Um, Salika and I will make sure of it. And if you don't know who Salika is, you will in just a minute. Um, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> uh, before I tell you about Salika, though, I want to introduce to you our very special panelist for this week, uh, Mr. Dana Walks, who is a lawyer with Gingras, Thompson, and Walks. They are involved in all kinds of civil rights work and civil rights litigation. He also served uh, in the Wisconsin State Assembly in the 90th District and ran for governor in 2018. Dana, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. All right. And then, uh, since everybody has been waiting with bated breath for this, since I mentioned something about it earlier, this is Salika. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Salika uh, Duxworth Lawton is um, a professor of at the uh, University of Wisconsin Eau Claire in history specializing in military history. She is the president of Uniting Bridges, a group here in town that's focused on uh, racial justice and reconciliation and equity. And uh, she also is my partner in crime on conversations in color. And generally speaking, I think, I think we go, it goes beyond conversations in color. Salika, welcome back to the show. Always honored to be here and especially happy to be here with you, Adam and Dana. I have known Dana for a while, so honored and blessed. All right. All right. And then uh, our last but again, not least participant in this conversation is the dashing and um, well-traveled, I understand, based on a conversation earlier um, connoisseur of wonderful international cuisines, Mr. Adam Akala from CoLab. He is here tonight to, uh, well, I'm going to let you tell us, Adam, what are you here to do tonight? Yeah, thanks, Ed. I'm here, as always, to focus on community engagement. So we want to hear from you. What do you want to know from this conversation? What do you want to hear from our panelists about? Um, over on the right-hand side of your screen here in Paragon, you're going to see a chat box. You can chat questions to us, and I will intersperse those into the conversation. If you're uncomfortable putting it in the public chat, you can feel free to right-click my name, and you can private message me any questions that you might have. Um, I will note that tonight we're focusing mostly on the Confederate battle flag. I've also posted in the chat um, a link to our YouTube a show from August 10th on monumental problems where we focus more on monuments. Um, and we do have a show on sports mascots coming up in January. So again, this episode will focus mostly on the Confederate battle flag. 
um, and the legality of it. So make sure that you chat those questions to us um, and get involved in tonight's conversation. It's a really important part of why we do this here in our community. All right. Adam, would you by chance have um, a little question to get us kicked off here? <laughs> we can't hear you, Adam. Oh, there you are. Yes. <laughs> All right. So the icebreaker for tonight is what fictional family would you want to be a part of? Ed, let's start with you. So if I want to be honest, when I was younger, it would have easily been the Cosby family. But in light of things, I, I feel a little differently about that now. So I'm not really sure what to answer because that was kind of my ideal and that all got kind of blown up on me. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Uh, the Skywalkers. The Skywalkers. That's a good one. Salika, what about you? This is going to sound a little weird. X-Men. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't sound weird, because I've seen your profile pic on Facebook. <laughs> Storm is, uh, I, I guess you, you, you would say Storm is my alter ego. So, And the mutants are, in many ways, a family. So I will say yeah. X. I love it. Dana, how about you? Adam, I never, I didn't quite hear your question in the first place. You broke up just at the, so I. Oh, yeah. Me. What fictional family would you like to be a part of if you could? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, well, I watched Little House on the Prairie a lot when I was a, when I was a little kid. I, I enjoyed that. It was a lot of nature in it. And it was, a, a, I think that was pretty cool. Yeah, but that dates me. I mean, that's like a thousand years ago. So I, <laughs> I watched that show. I, I, I watched that show. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Adam. We'll be hearing more from Adam a little later. Oh, Adam, what about you? Oh, yeah. easy. The Incredibles. So uh, much in the same vein as Salika, but definitely The Incredibles. Very nice. I'm gonna start calling you Jack Jack now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, well, tonight, hey, listen, we're, we're talking about a piece of cloth that's red and has some blue bars across it with some white stars in it. And, um, you know, this this particular piece of cloth um, has become a symbol of controversy in in the United States over however many years now. And yet it's something that we've seen flying over state capitals. We've seen it um, on the top of an orange car called the General Lee and the Dukes of Hazard back in the day, again, dating us a little bit. Uh, we've seen it on football uniforms. We've seen it in, on, uh, in the backs of pickup trucks and on front porches. It, it's, it's kind of all over the place. And of course, we're talking about uh, the Confederate flag. And again, I put that in quotes because we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. I will also say that you might have seen it on the bookshelf of a certain Bible college student back around 1997. Um, and I'm going to just leave that where it is right now. And you'll have to tune in to hear more about that a little bit later in the show here. Um, but I want to start out with, uh, with you guys talking about just like what is when we talk about the Confederate flag, the stars and bars, what are we even talking about with that? Salika, can you kind of break, break that down for us a little bit? Well, the, the irony is what we call the Confederate flag is not a flag that was actually adopted uh, by the Confederate States of America. I mean, it was a canton that was... What's a canton? Okay, a canton is a design, and it was used in... It was usually associated with General Robert E. Lee's um, Army of Northern Virginia, but the one that we see the most being claimed the Confederate flag is a square variant, is a rectangular variation that's referred to as the Naval Jack. 
And that I could go into the details between the two. The Robert E. Lee one's a little more square. The Naval Jack is more rectangular. But the thing is, you didn't really see Confederate flags as a part of these memorial displays until we see Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation movie in 1915, which retells really the Civil War as this honorable dispersal of Yankees and Black rule, um, links the Confederate flag at that point to Klan. You still don't see it the way you see it today until 1954. When the Confederate flag is adopted as a symbol of resistance to the Brown decision, which attacks separate but equal. The combination of the Confederate flag and the 1956 Southern Manifesto, which argued for the states to, the Southern states to use all legal and sometimes non-legal means to resist what they saw as the Supreme Court encroachment was linked to the 12 states of the Confederacy then <coughs> putting the Confederate flag as a symbol of defiance into many of their flags. This is where Mississippi adopts it as part of the Mississippi state flag, Alabama, Tennessee, et cetera. And what you see when you watch the videos of the civil rights movement are people who <coughs> adopted the Naval Jack or they're using the small, the Naval Jack's on a smaller flagpole. The Army in North Virginia is on the long pole. It's the bigger one. They're using that as their symbols of resistance. In the 1990s, you will see Dixie Outfitters begin to refit the Confederate flag, claiming that it's not a symbol of hate. It is a symbol of tradition. Because in the 1970s and 80s, you'll see organizations like the U.S. Army, many schools, et cetera, are going to ban the Confederate flag. They also ban what's called the, the Black Liberation flag. That's the red, gold, and green flag that the Black Panthers used and call them symbols of hate. So sometime around between 1993 and 96, because of Dixie Outfitters and other groups really uh, trying to adopt that stand, you begin to see people pushing the Confederate flag as a symbol of rebellion, as a symbol of rural rebellion, or as a symbol of Southern tradition. When I got to Eau Claire in 1993, no one, blue Confederate flags. In 1988, 1999, that was when for the school district, we first saw problems with people with Confederate flags on cars, et cetera. And the kids claimed that it was being sold to them as a form of rebellion. So today, about 30% of the population see, this is according to Pew poll, um, see the Confederate flag as offensive. 58% doesn't care about it. And the remaining, oh, the number I have in front of me is 12%, uh, feels that it is a symbol of tradition. It's a symbol of their heritage. I'm a black Southerner. I was born and raised Slidell in New Orleans. I remember the Klan marching up Gauss Boulevard, Highway 90 with Confederate flags and guns. Uh, my family has been in the has been in this country before it was the United States of America. The Confederate flag is not my heritage. Now, if your heritage is trying to keep people enslaved, um, you know, for me and for most historians, this is not a hard question. Uh, but it, it becomes for some people this logical conundrum because they think it's a symbol of going with the wind and all of these other things. But what they don't want to talk about are the slaves 
that were in the background that made Gone with the Wind. Yeah. And, and the fight against it after Charleston, after the murders in the church, you know, that's when you in you saw serious attempts to ban it. Mississippi just banned it in November, in the November election, has coincided with a push for us to see plantations as terror camps and work camps along the lines of the Holocaust. For us not to see them as romanticized places of gentility, but to see them as places of horror and tragedy, to see them with a more accurate history. So we still have a tension here, and this is where I'm going to throw it back to you and Ed, between the First Amendment right, which the Supreme Court has said to fly the Confederate flag on your property, et cetera, and the right of others not to be threatened. In certain instances, a Confederate flag will be a protected speech. In other instances, a Confederate flag will be harassment. I, as a Black person, may be offended by a Confederate flag on somebody's bumper, but I have no right to ask them to take it off. But if they try to paint that on my uh, garage door, in many ways, that's a recognized threat. I'm going to throw that over to Dana and let him pick up on that, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a history here that kind of bears uh, talking through. Um, in, for instance, in a, in a school session setting, uh, some speech is protected and some speech isn't. In uh, 1969, the uh, United States Supreme Court in the Tinker decision, um, they held that children wearing armbands, four kids were wearing armbands with a peace symbol on it, and they held in the Tinker decision that that was protected speech, that Abe Fortas actually, it's a famous quote, Abe Fortas said that uh, children, words, I'm going to paraphrase it, but words to the effect that children do not leave the First Amendment, their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. So they said that it can be protected speech, but they, they put, they pronounced a test on what, what speech is protected and what speech isn't protected. In the Tinker decision, it, it's uh, called the substantial disruption test. If a symbol is going to cause disruption of the academic community and disruption of, of the uh, discipline so as to allow teachers to teach, then in that event, that is no longer protected speech. I mean, the First Amendment has always had, uh, some, you know, certain in, s places that uh, there are isn't protected speech. For instance, you can't walk into a crowded theater and yell fire if there isn't a fire. That's not protected speech. That would be probably a misdemeanor to do something like that. Well, the same is true in a protected environment like a school or a university. There are certain symbols that will bring about disruption. And at that point, uh, that's really kind of the extent of your First Amendment rights in, in those situations. Is it going to disrupt the community? Is it going to insult people so as to cause unrest? And And that's really the test. I mean, is this offensive speech that will cause a disruption in the in the community that's not protected and it shouldn't be i mean our supreme court historically has you know in, in many cases uh found situations where the the confederate flag is not permissible because it's so disruptive and it's so it represents terror and horror in the lives of people that you know went through slavery and, and discrimination and and abuse, frankly, um, and 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 it's and it's something that should it's protected in the sense that, as Salika said, somebody puts a Confederate flag bumper sticker on their car. Well, that's a private action. That's on your car. That's you know that's a place where that could be construed as protective speech, protective speech. But if you, 
if you wear a t-shirt with a Confederate flag into a school in violation of, of school rules and you, and you don't uh, foul the superintendent or the teachers you know, asking you to remove the shirt or asking you to turn it inside out, uh, that very often is not, most often it's not protected speech because it's so terribly offensive. I mean, the same would be true. I, well, you know, Germany obviously has completely different rules on free speech, but, you know, they, they banned the swastika with good reason. And, 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 and this, this flag is akin to an American Holocaust. It truly is. It, it, you know, some of these people talk about, well, the Civil War was about states' rights. Well, finish the thought. What's the rest of the story there? It's states' rights to have slavery. It's just yes. outrageous. It was um, so, actually even specific, Dana. Like if you look at some of the early Confederate, like establishment of their government writings, it was, it was explicit that the states' rights that they were most concerned about were those of slavery. Absolutely. It, it was, it's a, it's a tragedy. And it, it needs to not bear any more than disdain, frankly. It's just outrageous. And, so, uh, and we'll you know, the Seventh Circuit hasn't spoken directly. That's the circuit that we're in, in the federal courts. It has not spoken directly on the Confederate flag, but the Sixth Circuit has several times. Uh, Barr versus LaFoe, Defoe versus Spiva. Um, and if a school system puts together rules that are reasonably calculated or are based on a reasonable forecast that there'll be disruption, insult, or, or perhaps violence, then in that event, you know, speech like that would not be protected at all in the school. And, uh, and that's been tested several times. Not in the seventh, but I'm I'm quite sure that the precedence in the sixth would would that logic would clearly come into play here. It has not been my understanding is that it hasn't hasn't been uh, directly ruled on in the seventh. I think um, just bear with me as I walk through this a little bit, but I think you know there's one question about legality, right? That's the but. Then there's the what when you get deeper than the law, and I say this in the most respectful manner I, I can in respect to the law, but you go deeper than the law and you go into just people. You know, when you think about it on a on a people level, um to me, like, you know, it's it's kind of I think about some of the things I learned back in Sunday school back in the day, just because it's okay to do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do it, you know. Just because it's, it's legal to do it doesn't mean you should do it. Um, mm -hmm. Just because it's permissible doesn't mean it's beneficial. Um, and so, I, you know, it's just one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking, Dana, is um, I, I think the legal aspect of it is important. And I want to keep unpacking that. But I think I want to pause that for a moment, if we can, and really talk about the the human impact of the display of that flag and what it means right now. Like, you know, Silica did a fantastic job of walking us through the history of the flag um, since its inception. But when, when people see the flag, what, I mean, what does it mean right now in current 2020, almost 2021, as crazy as that is, United States of America, what does it mean when we see that flag? So I throw that out there and, I, and I'll throw a little nugget out there and I'll ask you guys to, to follow up on it. When I see it, I see complete disregard for certain people. That's, that's what I see. That's the first thing I see. Now, that's my own as the father of a black son that, and somebody who has cared about this stuff for a while, that's, that's how I'm, that's my filter, right? That's how I see it. But I'm curious, and I'd love to hear from, from you all, uh, and Adam, even if you've got something you would want to chime in here on, I'd love to hear from you all. What, what does that mean right now? 
you know, it's, and I say this as a black Southerner, Southerners like to play semantic games. We like to play word games. And, and, and the people who fly that flag, they know it irritates the heck out of many black people, and especially out of Southern blacks like me. But I especially think of what was called the Greensboro Massacre in 1977, where civil rights activists and economic rights activists burned a Confederate flag in Greensboro. And in response, the Klan killed three people. And two juries refused to convict. It was jury nullification. So, so we have these people who are giving the Confederate flag this status equal to and sometimes higher to the American flag. And they use it as a symbol of terrorization. When I see it on an automobile or I see somebody wearing it, and I've had to see some people with tattoos on it because with of it on their arms. And, you know, I've done some work with Expo and there's some people who, you know, they've gotten the tattoos and they change and everything, but they can't get the tattoos off. I will say it gives me pause. It makes me very careful. And it means this is not somebody who I'm going to be quite as trusting with. If they come into my classroom, I'm going to give them the same service I give every other student. But I'm not going to say that I won't be nervous and I won't worry about my safety. So I don't know how the rest of you well, I see think it I, in this historical way. I think it's okay to pause on that for just a moment, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I am interested in hearing what the other two white guys think, but hearing the black woman on this panel talk about this carries a little bit more gravity than the three white guys. Well, so but it's, it's, it's white people who don't really sometimes understand why that, you know, the, the Confederate flag and the N word to me in some ways are linked in my mind. And the issue, I think Dana is the same, that they are disruptive. And they're seen as threats. And there are people who don't understand. They don't see the history. They want to see them as this thing disconnected from the history. But you can't just take the history away. You, you can't send them out into space and, and make them something different. And where I'm from, there were lynched bodies who had Confederate flags draped on them. So, so that, and, and that's something that I think if you're a black person raised by black parents with ties to the South, which the majority of black people in the United States have, that, that's a reaction that you are taught because it's a way of protecting your personal safety. to not trust these people because no matter how they sound and no matter how nice they seem, that flag gives away the true intentions. Yeah. Well, and when you, when you see the, I'm sorry, Adam, I'll, I'll defer to you here in just a moment, but I was going to say when you see sometimes, especially in protests or counter protests or whatever, that flag being displayed alongside the Nazi swastika, that, that also presents problems. So Adam, I'll, I'll uh, defer to you here. Yeah, I think just quickly on the matter, in Wisconsin, it, it, we shouldn't be seeing it. We just simply should not be seeing the Confederate flag. It's a, it's a disgrace to our ancestors who fought for the Union and against what the South was doing to Black people. Um, it's, it's disgraceful to our history as Northern Wisconsinites. Um, for me, as a gay person, though, as well, usually there are a lot of things behind just the racial connotations of the Confederate flag. Like you said, Ed, oftentimes it's flown next to the Nazi flag, and Nazis advocated for genocide of gay people. So it is, it's kind of synonymous with other hate and other groups that target marginalized communities. So 
that's that's what I see when I see the Confederate flag. Yeah. There's a certainly irony in it. Minnesota in, I want to say, in battle in 1864, managed to take the um, Army of North uh, Virginia's flag. And they display that Confederate flag at the Minnesota Historical Center in St. Paul. Virginia has tried to sue four times to get the flag back. <laughs> But it has been taken under arms and Minnesota is keeping it. So so I tell my students that and, and I point out that, you, you know, the people under the flag shot at your ancestors and your ancestors, whether they were from Minnesota or northwestern Wisconsin, because there were northwestern Wisconsinites in the Minnesota, as well as some Minnesotas in Minnesota people in the Wisconsin 8th, which is from this area. <laughs> And that's why that eagle is on top of Memorial, because old Abe was the eagle for the Wisconsin 8th. So it was the Wisconsin 8th and the Minnesota troops that worked together to take that flag. So, so this flag that the Minnesotans are saying, no, you don't get to have it back. And the last <laughs> time they tried to do it was like, I think was October of last year. <laughs> no. Let me just say, as a native Virginian, I, I fully support Minnesota keeping that stupid flag. <laughs> <Yeah. Right. laughs> but it, it, this is, you know, you, you look at that and the people who really study the, the Union side of the Civil War in Minnesota are like, nope, you don't get this flag back. Nope, 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 nope. It's a matter of pride. But yeah. the, the people who really don't understand the Civil War don't understand that they're great grandparents were shot at by people flying that flag. And yep. it's not that far away. Yeah. So I'm curious, uh, Dana, in terms of like this, the connotations when you see the flag being flown, like what does that, first of all, what does that say to you? And then what do you feel like it means when somebody is flying the flag? You talked about this a little bit earlier, but could you expound upon it a little bit? You know, I, I, I got a, I, I think I would, I, and I told you earlier that we do a lot of focus groups at, at our, with our firm, getting ready for jury trials. We, I think we probably do more than anyone. And, um, and I think those, now we're coming with a broad brush, but those people that are flying that flag or, or taking pride in that flag, I think you take a spectrum and you have perhaps uneducated and selfish and uh, impulsive in your face would be on one end and then flat out mean hatred would be on the other but it's in it's in there somewhere there's a burgeoning hatred that was unleashed in the last four years it's always probably been there based on the focus groups that I've done, but I think it was unleashed and it was, it was okayed with this administration. Well, I don't want to get into the political side of oh, things. Okay. But, I think we've talked openly about that here. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, you know, and I, and it just burns me up. If you want my reaction about it, I, I just, I'm just livid about it. My father was an attorney prosecuting Nazis after World War II. He was in, in the criminal investigation division. His first language was German. And he had also just finished law school at Marquette. And the, the horrible stories and things that one person can do to another person. And when you institutionalize an attitude like that, which is, which is represented by that flag, and it's represented, you know, by the, the, the swastika. When you institutionalize that, that is, that's the poster child for why we have the laws that we have in this country. And we need to use those laws so that we can head off catastrophe. And we've already seen when somebody says it's okay to go out and, and, and be mean to people, we've seen how that's worked last four years in particular but i think we need to be zealous we need to be 
vigilant and we need to, to, to make sure that we have safe institutions and and common values as much as we can but there are you know there are people that we have seen that are just flat out mean and 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 hating and it's 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 just awful and so i get kind of mad when i see that and i see once in a while you'll see a pickup truck blowing around or two i saw one with three of them well it was a certain political candidates flag in the middle and then two other um two of these flags and this guy's driving around trying, what is, what is what is what are you trying to say are you and then they'll be they'll be flying the american flag that's that's completely inconsistent because these people were revolutionaries they were they were traitors to the united states and uh it makes no sense at all um, some of the activities that these folks are, are in. And it's just so it gets me mad, to be quite frank. Yeah. I would say, too, that, uh, the, the, you know, I think there's a good chance the display of the flag, of that flag now means something different um, than it did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, for the very reason you're talking about. I think um, we've talked on this show about how our current administration, um, with the way things have been said, the way things have been handled, um, has, it feels like has given a sense of permission for people to speak openly about things that have lived in them for a long time. Um, and to that, I'd say thank you, because I'd rather know what's really living in somebody than to think that they're my buddy when they're not. Um, yeah. So anyway, all that to say, I think, um, I think it's important for us to put a pin in this moment in history and say this is what it means right now versus what it has meant historically. And it's a it's been a progression or regression, depending on how you want to you know look at it. But um, what the what that flag meant in 1865 versus what it meant in 1915 versus 1954 versus 1968. You know, as you go down the line. It seems like the intensity of what that flag means continues to just kind of uh, just increase in some ways. And I'm not saying like in, in, in 1915, that flag, you know, may have been, was a flashpoint for people to get up in arms and, and what I'm not saying that's not true. I'm just saying that it feels like there is a willful a willful rebellion slash disregard for others that I see evident yeah. playing the flag now that's different in my mind. And it, and I, it extends. It, it, it all, it, that's willful disregard of those who are around you extends to things. Like what's the deal with, you know, this is jumping a bit, but what's the deal with people not wanting to wear a mask to protect the people standing next to them from this from that their right somehow trumps other people's uh, right to health and dignity. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So and I, I think that you're right. I think that this flag is a, is, is a marker of sorts in showing disregard of, of other people. And I don't know where that anger comes from exactly, but there's an angry bent to it too. I mean, it's somehow... I, I just don't know where that anger comes from, to tell you the truth. And it's, it's disturbing. Yeah, it's obviously we don't want to get into the mask discussion here. Unfortunately, that's become politicized like everything else. Um, <laughs> but it, but it is there is something there is something akin in those dynamics. There's that um, that rebelliousness, that defiance um, that. Yeah, I'm not going to put a value judgment on defiance, but. Salika, you've got burgeoning thoughts, I can tell. I can see your Well, there's, a, you know, and I, I do think it started when I was in college and with talk radio and the end of the fairness doctrine. When the idea of yanking people's chains and offending people and not having to have both sides on really became a thing. And, and this idea that offending people was good and somehow showed how tough you are, or, yeah. or how intelligent you are. And obnoxity became linked 
for certain cultures to um, a certain type of uh, manhood or a certain type of intelligence. And, and you see that with that Confederate flag in many ways, because these people are saying, well, we think you're subhuman and you can't do anything about it. Nah, 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 nah. So there's a, this element of obnoxious child <laughs> in all of it. I mean, when you sit back and, and you look at it, there really is this element of this was a 12 year old who didn't get their butts beat on the playground back in middle school when they probably should have. <laughs> and, and they enjoy the fact that they are irritating people who look like me or scaring people. They think it's funny, mm -hmm. you know, and it's one thing when they're obnoxious frat brothers who pull down your sweatpants when you're not looking and doing things like that. That's stupid too, but that's not threatening. You know, when, when these people think that being vicious is, is being funny and, and that's literally what they, they think this is funny, it's hilarious, and it makes them feel powerful. It's bullying writ large. And I remember seeing it um, at, OS, at Ohio State's campus when I was there. Not just with race, I'm a Catholic, and I would wear a green scapula, the cloth scapulas, and people would yank on that scapula and tell me I was going to hell because I'm a Catholic. You know, so, so I really think that I feel like it really started in that 82, 83, 84 period with this emergence of this idea that, oh, there's somebody, let's go irritate them. This will be a fun thing. Yeah. I think uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause here for just a moment because I think we got to be careful about the generalizations a little bit and I'll, I'm going to fill, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a little bit me playing devil's advocate and it's a little bit me speaking from some experience, which I'm not going to tell about that experience until later. And you're going to have to stick with this until the end, if you want to hear more about that. Um, but I think that there may be other, like Dana, when you were talking about when these, in these focus groups, you had kind of the spectrum between kind of mean and hateful and, somewhere close to mean and hateful, but not quite mean and hateful. I can't remember the exact verbiage, but it was not good at all. Um, I think it was between ignorant and mean. It was, I think that was kind of the spectrum. Um, and then, you know, like Salika, you're talking about folks will display the flag just to be bullies. And it's, you know, they think it's funny to, you know, lord that stuff over people like that, but the fact that they can do it. There may be other dynamics in play. And um, I would say it's something that we I would like for us to tackle a little bit on the flip side of what I'm getting ready to do, because I'm going to reintroduce everybody and kind of reset the stage here a little bit. But one of the things I'd like to talk about is maybe what the difference means regionally in the United States. So what that flag means in northern Wisconsin versus what it might mean in a certain place like where I grew up in Virginia versus Louisiana. Um, and those kinds of things and how, how that might impact that spectrum that Dana's talking about. You might have some people who are genuinely well-meaning and extremely ignorant, um, in some of these places. And, and, and so I want to talk about that a little bit more, but before we do that, let's take a moment and introduce everybody. Hey, if you're tuning in, uh, after some time after the very beginning of the show, this is Conversations in Color. We're so glad you're listening in. Uh, my name is Ed Hudgens. I'm hosting the show. I'm from Converge Radio. And I got my hand in a bunch of other stuff, too. Um, and then we've got tonight our very special panelist, Mr. Dana Walks um, of, uh, of 91st District Wisconsin Assembly fame, as well as he ran for governor in 2018 and has been involved in some important legal work for a long time here in the region. And then we also have uh, Dr. Saliga Duxworth-Lawton, UW Eau Claire history professor, uh, Uniting Bridges president, and just like general troublemaker. Um, we also have 
my brother Adam, who is uh, is watching the chat function over here. Um, Adam works with CoLab here in downtown uh, Eau Claire. Adam, how are we looking? You want to kind of remind people what what's happening with the community engagement part? Yeah, sure thing. So I see a lot of us are joining on the call here tonight on Paragon, so that's really awesome. Um, I'm seeing a lot of familiar names from past weeks, so it's great to have you here week over week. Um, as always, feel free to drop any questions that you have for our panelists in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, your feedback and your questions are super important to how these conversations go, because we want to know what our community wants to know, um, and be sure to answer those things. Cool. Um, Ed, there's a quick question, I think, geared towards Dana. Um, from Kristalina here. Can it be argued that even the display of a Confederate flag on private property incites violence against black people and other marginalized communities? Well, I think I think she's right. I think it I think the, the symbol in and of itself is is insightful of violence and and, and 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 degrading of humanity. And I I wouldn't have that thing anywhere near me. And you know, but the question then is, what is a First Amendment right to expression? And, you know, if it's on your own car, you know, I, I suspect the courts would protect it. I'm, I'm virtually sure they would. But if it's, if it's being used to, to engage in violence or promote violence or, or promote um, people's feeling insecure in a public setting in a in a public place like a school where there's some um some um you know obligations to protect uh people uh then you know that that's a different thing altogether but yeah on private property i think it's that's you know that's first amendment rights probably so Dana, we've used the car a couple times as kind of an example of something that's protected. If the car is used as a weapon or a method of intimidation, like a, a, a big truck with a conservative flag flying off the back of it, um, a Confederate flag, I'm sorry, flying off the back of it, um, revving their engine at a group of protesters, for example, could that then be kind of an impetus for engaging with that person because we have a third flag or would it be more so the intimidation factor if it's being used in in conjunction with an assault or a battery that's a different thing but um that's pretty hard it, good luck prosecuting some of you know engine revving isn't isn't gonna probably probably yeah. do it uh, but if it's engine revving and and there are protesters walking down the street and you're right behind them, you know, I think that, you know, that's another thing. I mean, because we've already seen people run down protesters and, uh, you know, at some point that becomes a threat. Absolutely. Um, and you could most likely get charged with disorderly conduct or something akin to that in that circumstance. But if he hits somebody, that's a different thing than, than, than we're looking at prison time. And maybe this is veering a bit outside of the scope of the conversation, but as far as displaying a Confederate flag and then potentially using a vehicle as a weapon, so for example, um, Virginia, a couple of years ago when the protester was run down, um, would, would the Confederate flag being displayed be impetus for charging with a hate crime? Or would that be? It, it kind of could great? be. It certainly could be evidence of it. It's certainly a piece of of evidence. There's no question about that. I'm not a criminal lawyer. Well, I used to be a hundred thousand years ago. I I did criminal law, but it's been uh, it's been a couple of decades plus. Um, so I, you know, I'm not sure what all the elements are that they need to prove in a hate crime situation. But it sure as heck would be evidence of it. You know, same with the, the Nazi swastika. That if somebody's, you know, threatening violence or or making motions that are are could be perceived as a threat, and they've got, you know, they've got a swastika on their car or this Confederate flag, you know, that's sure as heck evidence that somebody's going to use in the prosecution. I have a I have a legal a legal question. Um, if I see a, re a Confederate flag 
on a car or a sticker on a car of the Confederate flag, can I just destroy it? Not the car, the sticker. <laughs> no, it's private property. <laughs> I'm only halfway through. You think I'm gonna advise you to do that? <laughs> All right, let me give let me give Dana a real situation I dealt with. I think it was like 10 years ago. I, I had a, a interesting student. Uh, we'll, we'll start it with that. And uh, said student decided to wear a Confederate flag on his shirt and come into my classroom and sit in front of me in the Confederate flag shirt. Uh, at that point in time, the university's argument was, well, he had a First Amendment right. I could not take that as a threat, no matter what my cultural heritage was because this is an adult and they argue that because it's an adult tinker does not apply. Today, I suspect in this age of mass shootings, they would react to it very differently. Does that make sense? I think so. If, if this happened to a black or gay um, or multicultural professor today, a student was coming in wearing something with anti-gay rhetoric on their t-shirt or with a Confederate flag on their t-shirt, would they have a right to feel intimidated and ask for that student to be removed from their class in a college level situation, you think? Because it feels like intimidation and it's happening across the country. We're seeing a number of black faculty being intimidated by people doing this. Um, so, and but they're hiding behind the argument. Well, it's free speech. We're adults. Tinker doesn't apply. You know, we'd have to look at the policies of of the institution, and they may be different. Each each institution, it it it's a close call. I mean, some of this stuff, it's it's like the Supreme Court's definition of obscenity. Well, they could never really totally. <laughs> define it therefore it is when they'll they'll know it when they see it whatever that is and, and but this is what court of appeals are for this is somebody could bring a lawsuit and and make a claim that this is intimidation of me and you know in in my in my workplace and it's not a safe workplace with this going on and there's um you know there there's case law that would support bringing such a lawsuit, but I don't know that we'll, you win, you know, we'd have to research the living dickens out of that. But if that's becoming a thing, um, I know that in, uh, I don't remember the name of the case, but there's, there's a case out there where a teacher was, it's being litigated now, not by us, but there's a case out there where a teacher was sexually assaulted by, by students and and then harassed by by students and that teachers brought a lawsuit um and and that hasn't that decision isn't done yet they're just really getting going so i mean these are gray areas that i live in a world of gray i'll tell you that i mean the legal world there there's there's nothing but gray. you know the question is what would the court of appeals do when the sixth circuit, circuit even the sixth circuit, circuit is different than the, the seventh? I mean, you know, and the Supreme Court doesn't speak on every issue, but if there's a pattern, and if the in, in the institution isn't protecting an employee, that that's probably a case, even if they are adults. That institution owes uh, in loco parenti, as you know, is that the old adage that if you send your kid to school, then the teachers and the principals and the school system are acting in stead of the parents. They're they're standing in the shoes of the parents, and that kind of was done away with uh, for, for universities quite a while ago. But it, but it's still an employer has an obligation to make sure that the the employees are safe. I mean, we 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 litigate that pretty regularly around here, um, and 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 if you're not safe in your workplace, you've got a case. Well, I think that 
I mean, we're seeing it, as I said, with the Confederate flags, especially in the South. Um, there's one case of that I know in Minnesota. I know of two cases in Texas. I have friends in Ohio who are talking about it happening there. Um, and it seems like for universities are also in this gray area because what is academic free speech? And there's this idea that you know, every obnoxious idea should be aired and just met with more speech, <laughs> which was the standard up until, like I said, probably about two years ago in this age of mass shooting. And what that meant was the onus was put on the people who were targeted to really tolerate um, a lot of things that you know, if you belong to one culture, you see it as a threat. You belong to a different culture, you don't see it as a threat. And for many whites, the Confederate flag doesn't look like a threat. It just looks obnoxious. Whereas for people of color, that Confederate flag looks like a threat. You know, and I think for universities, this is a hard road. It's a, it's a hard needle to thread. You know, especially if you have a faculty member who's harassing another faculty member that way, but when you have a student harassing a faculty member, because we come down pretty hard on faculty who harass students. Um, but the other way we do tend to be fairly lenient because we see students as still learning. Students may be adults. I'm gonna use that term with a couple of quotations. But good faculty know that an 18 year old in your class was a high school senior just three months ago. You know, and if you're like me, I, I'm the mother of a 21 year old. It's hard for me. I look out there. These, these kids are younger than my son. I'm looking at them like, you know, I, I can't hold them to the same level of accountability as someone who is 30 and should know better. But there is a certain level of accountability that we need to find, I guess, in this gray area for universities between academic right to be obnoxious and threatening people and making it hard for them to do their jobs. And I see Ed yeah. putting the finger up, so he's got an idea here. But I have a problem and I need help with this problem. No, I don't, no, let me, let me restate that. I'm, I don't need help with this problem. I'm gonna make this statement. And then I'm going to ask Adam to lead us into more questions because I know we've got more comments and questions. Um, and I want to make sure we give enough time for that. So doesn't it tell us something when we're equating wearing something that has an anti-gay message on it with the Confederate flag? Doesn't it tell us something about the nature of that message that that flag is giving? So that was a question, but it was rhetorical. I don't want you to answer it. Um, but that, that, that's just where my mind went during all that. Adam, you've got, um, you've got, I know, some great stuff from the community. I can see some of it here. Uh, would you please uh, just kind of keep teeing us off here a little bit with some of these questions? Yeah, sure thing. Um, we can't I think hear some you. of these questions. Oh, there you are. Am I, am I up? Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, sounds good. Now we can't. All right. <laughs> now we can't. Okay, interesting. Here, let me refresh and I'll come back. I, uh, I want to, while we're waiting for Adam to come back here, um, Lydia, I see your comment there about how in, how in this day and age do you not know what is involved with the flag? Um, I don't know that one can honestly claim ignorance, not today. I hear you. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Adam, what did you have in mind? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Um, I think a couple of these questions are gonna be really great for um, a future episode that we're having on civility and just having these types of discussions. Um, but Samantha's wondering, can anybody give me some advice on, in terms of how to approach this conversation with my family? She says that she's attempted to try to ask questions to see how much they know about the Confederacy. And it's usually not actually much, but wondering if that type of condescending approach, although I don't think it's necessarily condescending, it's just corrective, 
um, it's necessarily the best way to approach it when talking with your family about why this is offensive. And Salika, I just want to point back to um, talking about offense. And I think that we, we say offense when oftentimes we really mean trauma or traumatic. Mm. Uh -huh. and, and that is what is happening with this imagery to people of color and people of other marginalized communities with the Confederate battle flag, with the swastika, with, I mean, even someone brought it up with mega hats. You see, you see this imagery and it, it's traumatic based on lived experiences. Lived experiences over the past four years from marginalized communities have often included the limiting of their rights by the administration that's currently in office. So um, how, do we, how do we bridge this gap with our families and make them understand, especially the conservative members of our families that call people that say that we're offended by these things snowflakes, when it's really just, it's really trauma that we're experiencing when we see this imagery. Well, these tend to be people who live in all white spaces, so they haven't seen it for themselves. And, and you know, we, one of the things we have to get past is this idea that we can just educate people and they'll do better. That's not, that doesn't work. <laughs> some, some people that we'll work with and some people you're just going to have to be very pragmatic and appeal to that baser instinct. Baser instinct here is, you know, your Confederate flag can keep you from getting a job. You know that your Confederate flag can get you fired from a job. And we're a right to work state. They're not, you know, most companies don't want to risk having a, a lawsuit from somebody because of a Confederate flag. Although Evidently, there's been two instances here in Eau Claire with people leaving nooses on people's lockers where the companies have not moved quite as fast as they should have. Those people, uh, my understanding is some of those people are going to talk to the press and they're going to try to deal with that. But I think to talk to them about, do you know how this looks? Do you know what kind of economic damage you can do? You know, do you want to give up a job because of a stupid flag? You know, this is not. The flag is not considered professional or appropriate. And if you've got it all over your Facebook page and you're looking for a job, Facebook has a lot of back doors that people don't seem to know about. I've had to sit down two graduate students and tell them they haven't gotten jobs because of stuff that was on their Facebook pages. Since both of them were male and one of it involves nudity, I had to get male professors to sit in that room with me where I had to tell a male graduate student, um, you need to take these pictures down because they saw this on your Facebook page. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, I know. I sound like a, I sound like everybody's mom. You just do not understand how embarrassing that is to me to have to do that. I am approved, okay? So, so sometimes the best way to get people to stop acting stupid is to say, you know, I want what's best for you. And I'm afraid that this is presenting you in a way that really is going to keep you from getting to the places where you want to be. And I don't want that to happen to you because I love you. You know, and, and well, and we, oh, look, we all have family members who we love who are just stupid. OK, that's every family. I've got them. Everybody's got them. Some of them you can't say nothing to. They, they won't listen. But there's others you have to gently bring them along, gather them with love and care. And you can't say it's stupid. You have to say you're not presenting yourself in a professional manner. I know you're better than this, but an employer won't. You know, so get rid of the Confederate flag tattoo. You might want to cover that up before you go for that police interview. Salika, <laughs> you know? I'm amazed at your pragmatism. Like for me, I'm I'm all, I'm thinking like the dream is get them connected with some black folks who have some lived experience that they can share with them. Because education won't do a thing. At the end of the day, education is just information. But when you actually connect with somebody who 
has gone through stuff and you look them eye to eye, that's where I think dynamics can change. But not everybody's going to have opportunities to do that. You know, like that's just the reality of it. I think they have to want to change, though. Yeah. They have to want to change because I can go and personally talk to every racist in town. I may have at this point. I'm not sure. <laughs> but <laughs> I can personally go to that. But if they don't want to change, they're not going to hear me. Right. They are much more likely to hear somebody who they love looking at them and saying, you know, this is going to hold you back yeah. from the money that you want, from the career that you want, from the things that you want. And, and to be honest, you know, this was one of the hardest things for me as an adult to figure out, you know, to, to, to have to come to terms with. There are some people who they don't care about ethics. They don't care about anything else. It's can I get this job? Can I get this money? And, and can I do what I want? And they're not worried about anybody else. You know, and we, we have to be. If we want to make change in the world, we need to be realistic about how we bring those people along gently yeah. Yeah, and with yeah. care and respect. Yeah. And sometimes with some gritting of the teeth and some biting of the tongues, you know, <laughs> and not theirs. But, you know, you do the best you can. But again, you do the best you can. Dana knows me. He knows what he's getting into yeah. in this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm, that I'm more in that. I'm, I'm a little more blunt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to catch, I'm trying to catch my flies with a little honey. Because <laughs> when, when, when you're dealing with your family members, honey goes a lot, you know, I mean, unless it's your brother, then you just punch him in the face and you have the fight and you do that. I mean, we, some of us have those relatives, but most of them, <laughs> you use a little bit of honey. You use a little bit of sweetness to try to bring them along. And, and not every black person is willing to talk to people that they think might be racist. They're, they're, I mean, there's a bunch of people in town who think I'm crazy because of some of the stuff I've done. I mean, well, you, Ed and Adam have seen me and that, I think they probably think I'm crazy too. Yep. But, <laughs> you know, so there's not always gonna be black people around who are gonna wanna educate your crazy relatives. <laughs> Not everybody's going to be willing to do that. Well, and, nor and, they, and I'm not picking on her relatives because Lord knows I've got a couple. Don't get me started. I can't do that. I'll get in trouble and I'll get kicked out the family. So, you know, everybody's got them. Everybody's got them. We just don't all admit to it. I admit to it. <laughs> Adam, do you have a, is there another community question or comment that you wanted to bring up? Uh, we're not really seeing any major community questions, but I just kind of wanted to put a pin in what Salika said about um, just black people not necessarily having the capacity to deal with white people that are being racist and overtly racist at that, and that's where white allies need to step in, is yeah. we need to have conversations with their family because they're obviously not listening to people of color that are telling them their lived experiences. We need to be advocates. And yeah. so that, that's where we need to take up that responsibility and have those difficult conversations because they're not going to listen to other people. They're not going to listen to people that don't look like them. And they're not going to listen to people like Salika said that they don't love or that don't love them and come to them from a place of love. So it's, it's definitely up to allies to kind of take the bulk of that work at this point because they're not listening to anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that makes sense. It's hard when these people think that, you know, they believe these stereotypes. They believe that we are subhuman, um, people who look like me. They believe we are lazy. They believe we don't work. They, they believe we aren't even the same human species. Uh, and, and they need other white people to talk to them. Yeah. You know, either that or they need to be under gunfire with somebody of a different race. I mean, that will do it, too, but I don't recommend it. 
<laughs> you know, we can't just send the racists and the multicultural people, put them in the same platoon and go send them to Syria. It doesn't work that well. I mean, that is one way of curing racism. It worked in the 1950s, but I just don't recommend that way. Not a good idea. I think I think that uh, one of the, you know, when I talk about connecting your family member who is displaying the Confederate flag with, um, you know, a, a black community member who could talk to them about their lived experience, that's a stupid example. Um, I think what I'm really kind of getting at is how important the, um, when you can facilitate, not even facilitate, but when you can just, when connections happen between people from different backgrounds, that's when understanding starts to happen. And I'm talking about connection, not just we're going to talk at each other. I'm talking about we're going to come to the table, look at each other eye to eye. I really want to hear what you have to say. Um, because I think there, I believe, believe it or not, I think there are well-intentioned white people who are really ignorant because they're isolated in their communities and all they ever hear is from the same kind of people all the time. And I think if you get those people in the right circumstances where they're confronted with the realities of other people, that's where some real influence and change can happen. Um, because they, they, I can tell them all I want. This is the experience of my black brothers and sisters. This is what I see all the time. They're still not going to listen to me because it's not part of their experience. They don't, they haven't seen it. And so uh, that's just, that, that's where that came from. Well, the, I mean, the, with my students, the ones who are most likely to believe about racism and discrimination have been on traveling teams with multicultural people and they've witnessed the discrimination. You know, and we that, that's what, what I was trying to get at when I was talking about those bubbles in some ways, that, that we have people in these bubbles and because they've never seen it, it's very easy to say it doesn't happen. And it's very easy for us to demonize people who are not in our space. Yep. And this kind of gets to the conversation we were having before this happened, that there's, the, you know, the name calling, the demonizing, the dehumanizing. That's easy to do when peop those people, those people are not there. Right. And um, it's, it's harder, although some people will do it if there's one. That's why when you're doing hiring, you should be hiring two or three. Don't just hire one because one can be terrorized. But I, I think that for people who are ignorant, and to be honest, Ed, my teachers who I've taught at the graduate school level would agree with you. They think their students think that the Confederate flag just means rural rebellion and they don't get it. And I have to give them a whole bunch of pictures and send it back. And right. we do a lot of education. But the scary thing for me in Eau Claire is if I see a Confederate flag, do I take the chance that this person is ignorant or is this person going to hurt me? Right. You're asking me to make this really important decision um, about something that could become very scary. It's safest for me to just avoid them. That's right. But if I'm avoiding them, then, you know, it keeps perpetuating. That's why white allies have to be the ones to do the intervention. Mm -hmm. Totally with you. I mean, the thing of the matter is, I mean, you hear me kind of throwing out these devil's advocate kind of things. And, but the truth of the matter is I wish every one of those flags were burned and gone. I don't like, I never want to see another one again in my life. Um, but I, you know, I also know that there are people who are just stuck in their echo chambers and literally don't know any better. Um, and, 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 and among those ones who, if they had, a, if they sat with somebody they really trusted, who could walk them through some of the stuff that we've talked about tonight might actually change the way they think about it. Well, we have an education question that goes right to what Ed is asking. Adam, you want to catch that question? The high school yeah. curriculum one? Yeah. So Samantha's asking, do any of you think that there's a responsibility that should go to high school curriculums to ensure that this is being taught correctly and addressed in schools? And I mean, Dana, maybe you can speak to the, the implementation of 
either dress codes or um, conduct codes that schools may have that prohibit imagery of the Confederate flag. Um, yeah, you and how they can maybe directly tie their curriculum with why that is a thing in their dress code or conduct code. Dana, you go yeah, first well, and I'll pick up the curriculum part. Okay. Yeah, you, you certainly can have a dress code. You can certainly have a conduct code in, in, a, in a school setting. In fact, you need to. You really need to. And in order to provide for the safety of the students and the safety of the employees, um, you know, so you, you really need to do that. And I, and, and one of the things I know that it, it's gotta be 10 or 15 years ago, the state legislature passed legislation mandating that native American culture be treated or taught in, in the high schools. I'm not sure how much of that has actually happened, but yes, we can, we, we, we should mandate this. And I think there's been a drop off in, in it's it's absolutely amazing to me how many people have no understanding whatsoever of the republic that we're living in and, and of of general public and and responsibility within a community they just don't seem to get it i don't i don't know i think there's plenty of room for uh, uh you know for uh a better uh, curriculum, that's for sure. And that's certainly in Salika's, Salika's uh, uh, ballpark. Well, the DPI curriculum has included civil rights now. And what I'm going to recommend this to, to teachers who are on here is something that I do. Um, I use document reads to teach uh, why the Civil War was about slavery. Rather than me getting up there and lecturing about it, I give them, and Dana will, will recognize some of these documents, I give them the Declaration of Causes. Uh, they have the Confederate Constitution they have to compare to the, uh, to the American Constitution. I give them Andrew Stevens' cornerstone speech. Mm -hmm. and the state's uh, secession papers. But I also give them the newspaper articles about white Southerners who didn't want to fight for the Confederacy, being lynched, being shot, how many white Southerners refused to fight for the Confederacy, and Confederate uh, Civil War so, uh, letters. So they can see for themselves what the Confederate soldiers thought. And what they found was there was a lot of Confederate soldiers complaining, especially about what was called the 20 Negro or the 20 Slave Law. Um, the, they, a lot of those soldiers had been drafted and didn't want to fight. So this whole mythology about states' rights and honor, et cetera, these were people who were forced to fight and they didn't want to be there. And that, you know, give them the images of the Confederate flag. Give them the history of the Confederate flag. The reason why we dropped the um, Southern Manifesto and these other pieces in, let them hear the voices of the past talking about it. And it's not the teacher indoctrinating them. It's an accurate history. So if you set up a document read with some of these images and with some of these articles or, you know, through the Moore system, you can use the newspaper archive and the students can go into the newspapers and see the actual letters to the editor, et cetera. They learn what this Confederate flag meant. And uh, I think it's much more powerful for them to figure this out themselves by looking at the documents than it is for me to just tell them. It's not Dr. Ducksworth's lecture. When I also, Dana, I should have you lecture my class because I give them legal articles to read. They hate me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they have an article called Snubbed Landmark that is on the Cruikshank case. And it explains why lynchings took place from a legal um, perspective. And it goes through all the law and the history. 
for them to do a document read with that article and then to have to research a lynching is just far more powerful than me standing up there and talking about lynchings. Because now they have to see who was hurt and how they were hurt and that they had a history. These are not disconnected people. Yeah, I, I think this is really, I think one of the really important pieces of what you're saying, Salika, is um, the difference between interpretation of history by people and actual original documents from that history that tell the story for you. Mm -hmm. And this under, it undermines parents pushing back and saying this is a liberal um, agenda. Yeah. When it's the document. Yep, the original documents. Great We've idea. often had people do family oral testimonies where they can link them to the documents. Mm. And that brings parents into the picture and makes them start thinking, you know, half of the students who are going to come in my class, they're going to be conservative. Half are going to be liberal. The half that go out will be conservative. The half that go out will be liberal. But I want them to understand that there is one set of historical facts and, and not that you can just change the definition of words to fit whatever you want. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. That's a brilliant way to teach that, Salika. That truly is. I, I, I've not heard that technique before. That's very, very interesting. And, it, and it's accountable. I mean, they, right now they're finding out that this was not about states' rights. This was about, you know, slavery, and they're finding out that the real meaning of what a lynching is. I mean, it's just unbelievable terror. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna add in a little bit here some more personal experience to this story here because I think it'll help to kind of crystallize some of this for for some of us maybe. Uh, but I would one thing I want to ask, and, and we need to keep this brief. It's eight fifty three, as is always the case. Nine o'clock sneaks up on us pretty quickly when we're having these conversations. Um, what's one thing that you would encourage uh, everybody to do in response to what we've talked about tonight? I would ask both Dana and Salika if you could just, you know, what's something you would you would ask everybody to do in response to this? Well, I, I'll tell you, I think going into the archives, and I'm sure we can Google things like this, that Sedlika had just suggested, go back and read what the Atlanta Journal and these newspapers, whatever it was at that time, were talking about uh, during this war and, and what was going on. I think, I think that's a fascinating approach to this, and it brings to life what was really going on there. And, uh, you know, and I'm sure there are other newspapers that now there's going to be a lot of propaganda in something like that, I suspect, too. But but uh, I think that's a great idea. I, I would encourage people. To, I'm going to do it. I'll tell you that I'm, I'm going to Google that, and, you know, and and just take a look, because I think that's a fantastic idea. I really do. I have two suggestions for the teachers who are here. The first is that the entire Eyes on the Prize collection is on YouTube. Eyes on the Prize, Volume 2, Fighting Back, which is about the integration of the University of Alabama, the failed integration, Little Rock and Ole Miss. <clears throat> you show it in your classroom and you stop when they have the riot because Authorine Lucy came on campus. Let them see the Confederate flags as the symbol uh, that people were waving as they were threatening to kill her. Then show them the footage in that same video of the Ole Miss riots. Let them see the Confederate flags. Let them see how it was linked to the violence at Ole Miss. But the second thing um, that you can do is teach the Union Civil War history. Teach the Wisconsin Eighth. 
Talk about what the Wisconsin 8th went through at the Battle of the Crater. Talk about how at Gettysburg, that's act, it's actually Gettysburg when they took the flag. So it was, it was 1863 and not 1864. Talk about how much people suffered. Give them the Civil War diaries of these soldiers. Let them see that. And if you're giving them Civil War soldiers for Northerners and Civil War soldiers for Southerners, you know, have them look up the Battle of Nuences, N-U-E-N-C-E-S, which is where they massacred 41 German immigrants in Texas for refusing to fight for the Confederacy. You know, teach. Get let them. There's a lot of civil war heads around here. They love civil war. Give them the history we don't always talk about, but especially link it to that Wisconsin eighth, and then finally have them research Andersonville. Seven hundred Wisconsinites died at Andersonville. They were starved, they were shot, and they were tortured. There is a monument to the 700 Wisconsin POWs there. Because once you've learned that history of Andersonville, you can't look at any of these flags the same way. Because they saw the whites who fought for the Union as race traitors. And, and, and once they learn that, I think that will help to teach across that political line. Does this make sense? It does. It does. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit just as we're closing here more about understanding the history. And um, so I, I was I was born and raised in Virginia. And as soon as I learned anything about the Civil War, I was immediately interested in it. I went to all the battlefields on field trips, and my mom liked to go to them with me. <clears throat> but I remember even in fourth grade thinking the Union were the good guys and the Confederacy were the, was the bad guys because of the slavery issue. Well, as I grew older, and, and I also... Um, in my teen years, got passionate about social justice, racial justice, these kinds of things, um, was a was an outspoken advocate amongst my friends and family about these things. But when I went to college in, um, in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, a little school at the time known as Minnesota Bible College, I, uh, I went through a phase of kind of re- investigating the Civil War, the reasons for the Civil War. Um, I was a history minor. And somewhere along the lines, I found a book that talked about the relationship between states' rights and the Civil War. And when I read that book, I didn't read anything in there about specifically the state's rights being tied to the state's rights to have slavery legalized. In retrospect, my assumption is that the person who wrote that book had an agenda that I was not, that I didn't know about. I was ignorant. And I started having this kind of growth of Southern pride in me where it's like, oh, those flags don't represent racism. They don't represent slavery. They represent heritage, just like Salika was talking about earlier. And for a while, I actually displayed a couple of Confederate flags of the Confederate battle flag and then the actual flag of the CSA in my room, my dorm room at uh, Minnesota Bible College. And Nobody said anything about it, you know, like it was a very white school and nobody seemed too offended by it until one of my black classmates came and did a tour of the dorm and saw what I had on my bookshelf. And I remember her saying something to the effect of, um, I just don't understand how you could have that on, you know, like it was 
do you not understand what this is and what this means and how it impacts me and how it makes me feel? She didn't say it that way. She was much more diplomatic. She was much, um, she was very sensitive about how she said it. Um, but it impacted me and I didn't keep those flags up anymore. And I started thinking about it more. And it wasn't until recently that I read some of the stuff that Salika was talking about earlier in terms of the uh, the statement, the, the inauguration speech and stuff from Alexander Steve Stevens and um, not inauguration speech, but some of that early, those early writings, the, the constitution of the Confederacy, those things where I realized states rights for them was all about the right to have slavery. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. That, that was the argument. <laughs> and so, so I say that to say, first of all, there are probably people like me who have read the wrong things and haven't had a chance to read the right things yet or haven't been led to the right things yet. And, and so we want to have, have a certain amount of grace, but here's what I would say also. And this is the thing that I, that I think is at the core of all this. It's not about what's legal. It's not about um, heritage or any of that stuff. It's about what, when you do something, how is it impacting your, your brother or your sister? And I'm not talking about people that are in your blood family. I'm talking about other people. How does it impact the people around you? And for me, when I saw how what I was doing impacted my sister, it changed everything for me. Like I, I couldn't do that anymore. It wasn't until much later that I realized that, hey, this guy who wrote about states' rights, he was totally doing it from a tainted point of view and not trying to tell the whole story. That wasn't the, the point. The point is that my sister was hurt by the fact that I was displaying this thing that represented such trauma and terror to her and people of her heritage and her culture. So I want to thank, once again, uh, these incredible panelists, Salika, Dana, Adam, thank you for being here again. Thank you to Pablo Center, Uniting Bridges, Converge Radio. I want to tell you guys, and I'm going to put this right in the uh, chat right now. If you've missed any of our previous episodes um, or you'd like to catch this one again, you can go to the Pablo Center's YouTube page. There's a playlist of conversations in color um, where you can look at any of our any of our previous episodes and uh, and engage with it there. Um, and I want to invite you to come back next week. We have an exciting show where we're going to be talking about colorful families. And what I mean by that is talking about biracial parenting, parenting across um, racial lines, ethnic lines, some of the difficulties with that adoption. Um, uh, when it involves those kinds of dynamics, those kinds of things. We're going to have Burl Middleton, who uh, is well known here in the Eau Claire area, is a part of Uniting Bridges with Salika and has done a lot of great things in the area. Tanya Hughes, good friend of mine who was on just a few weeks ago when we were talking about Lament. And Rachel Pride, who was here a few months back, actually, talking about um, being Black in the Valley. And so I'm excited about this panel, and I hope you'll join us week for Conversations in Color. Have a great week and peace to all of you.